Hey, Emilia. Hi. So, my name is John Pfeffer, and I'm with the Institute for Policy Studies here in Washington, D.C., and I'd like to welcome all of you in person and also online. We're delighted that you are able to join us for this discussion on green colonialism. Those of you who are in the audience, you, are, you actually have the privilege of being able, if you want, to buy the books that are available in the back of the room. Those of you online, of course, can go online and purchase the book as well. Um, so I don't want to say that you uh, don't have that option. But those of you in the room, um, we have a couple of stacks. If we run out of those stacks, there are more books. So do not fear. What's that? I'm not leaning forward. Oh, I don't have to lean forward. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am delighted that we have this wonderful group of folks coming from uh, overseas to share their insights about the book. A little note before I introduce folks. Um, we're going to do this as a kind of a conversation. And the conversation is going to start up here, but then the conversation is going to go into the audience and also uh, from folks online. Um, and uh, we'll take some of your questions from uh, online. So if, as the event goes on, you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll pick them up. Um, let me introduce the folks up here. Um, beginning on my right, Sabrina Fernandez, who's from Brazil. She's the head of research at the Alameda Institute. <laughs> and some of you might know that uh, she, uh, and this was news to me, I did not know this, that she had a very considerable uh, presence online with her YouTube channel. Uh, so those of you who want to see her explanations in Portuguese about the world as we know it, can find them online uh, and on her, still her YouTube, YouTube channel still exists. Everything's still up on there. Excellent. Big Excellent. tech has a hold of me. <laughs> uh, and then my my colleague to my right, uh, Hamza Hamuchin, uh, who works with <laughs> <laughs> the Transnational Institute in uh, the Netherlands. And the TNI, of course, is uh, our uh, sister, brother organization of the Institute for Policy Studies. and. Um, and Hamza is the author of a fabulous book, Dismantling, or the editor of a fabulous book, Dismantling Green Colonialism, one of the two books on sale in the back. Um, and he has focused on North Africa and Middle East, uh, especially as you see with this re recent book, uh, Energy and Environment in that Region. Uh, and to my left, Miriam Lang, who is a professor of sociology and uh, she's an activist academic in Ecuador uh, and also a member of the Pacto Ecosocial e Intercultural uh, del Sur, the um, Ecosocial and Intercultural Pact of the South. Both Sabrina and Miriam are members of, of that pact. A wonderful organization that began in 2020. Uh, and um, I am going to begin, Miriam, with you. And I have a question for you. So here in the United States, and to a certain extent in Europe, we hear a lot about the Green New Deal. And in Europe, the European Green Deal. And I want to hear from you what the relationship is between the Green New Deal and green colonialism, which of course is the topic of both books that are available in the back of the room. Uh, What's the relationship between the two, other than the fact that they are both green or they have green in their titles? Thanks, John. Thanks to the IPS for uh, setting this up. Thanks to NetFi and all the people involved. Uh, I'm really happy to be here with Sabrina and Hamza again. <laughs> and thanks to all of you for coming and for attending online. Um, I think that fact that the debate on green new deals in plural has been launched both in Europe and in the US has been a very important step in order to address 
at least two dimensions of this poly crisis we are facing. Uh, that would be social inequality and exclusion on one side, and uh, on the other side, the environmental destruction issue. And to bringing them together instead of making them compete which, with each other, which is a strategy that we are facing often. Like if you want social inclusion, we have to do that at the expense of the environment or vice versa, yeah? So I think there has been important work done there, but <clears throat> what we sensed, like the people who gathered to promote, to, to put together this book uh, about the geopolitics of green colonialism was that there was a consistent lack of looking beyond national or in the case of the European Union, regional borders. It was like a very, um, self-referential debate, what is happening within the US and within the EU, and uh, the consequences or um, impacts that these policies would have on other parts of the world, namely the regions of the Global South, were quite absent from the discussion. There was some reference sometimes to it, like, yeah, we should put more money in the Green Climate Fund or so, but uh, there was no perspective of global justice. And it's evident that you can't have a sustainable and just future or even a just transition toward a sustainable future, which makes us live in dignified conditions on a planet that is a big ecosystem, which we are part of, if you only see islands of this planet. So there was a problem there and we wanted to address that and make a point that centers voices from the global south and also some ally, allies of those people in the global north in order to push the visibility of those impacts and consequences and make people think about possible strategies to overcome this gap. Excellent, thank you, Miriam. Um, you mentioned the Green Climate Fund, and, and the Green Climate Fund, of course, has been set up uh, a long time ago um, to transfer funds in some format uh, from the north to the south, obviously underfunded. Um, but we hear a lot about the Green Climate Fund as a mechanism, shall we say, of climate justice. Sabrina, how do you feel about the Green Climate Fund? <laughs> So let's talk about funding then. Um, thanks for the question, John. I think like some of the issues and the fact that we're here in Washington DC this week uh, with the spring meetings of the World Bank happening, like there's a lot of things around climate financing and funding going on. Um, the World Bank as interim host of the loss and damage fund, all of those conversations have brought us to a point where we understand that the level of funding that's promised is not enough. Uh, the past decade, uh, we were talking about like a, a total climate financing system of about $850 billion, including national government, public and like private financing, when we should have been like over 4 trillion at least. But we have an understanding that since the our, a lot of our demands are not even like not financial, they have to do with talk like colonial structures. They have to do with decision making. They have to do with power um, and how uh, the, like climate programs and transition projects are being driven either from the private sector or from heads of state rather than dealing with people on the ground. We cannot detach these conversations about um, the money that's being transferred to issues around democratic power. So we find that problems around Green Climate Fund are not reduced to the amount of money that's promised and never delivery, delivered, but also how it's been used as a mechanism for more indebtedness in many places. So the fact that it's easier for countries like France and Japan to issue uh, loans for projects especially around mitigation rather than adaptation, than to give grants. Uh, and this would probably, and most like most often, they end up getting filtered through um, international organizations or, or certain trusts that don't necessarily reflect 
the necessities of people on the ground or even go through pro proper consultation and decision-making processes that we might understand is a little bit more democratic. So we should never detach these issues around there. And we're already finding this with the fact that when it comes to loss and damage, we understand that money is not enough. And the longer that we uh, wait, the more insufficient is going to be because loss and damage is happening right now on the ground. So for us, from the perspective of dismantling green colonialism, as is the name of the book uh, edited by Katie and Hamza, uh, we, we don't want to be talking just like dollar signs and, and trillions, even though we understand that's important, but that's not the only way to approach the inequalities. Um, and it's definitely only one element in how we should be talking about reparations in general, right? Maybe just to complement that, there is a like a historical root in the historical colonial phase that was about our relations to nature and how uh, the colonial empires were imposing uh, both technology and a specific relation to nature on the peoples in the colonies. And I think this is just a continuity that we want to point out, because now the conversation is about how to conserve forests, in whose interest to conserve forests, for example, with all the offset schemes going on, and with all the financial interests shooting up lately, uh, in order to make profit from these forests and that that's the priority instead of really leaving them standing. Excellent. Well, thank you for, for providing kind of the overview for, for green colonialism. And, and a reminder, we have, we have three people here, two books, and Hamza, you're, you're in both. So, <laughs> so you're, you're perfectly placed to answer this question. Um, I think a lot of people want to know, well, can you give us an example of green colonialism, something concrete. Uh, can you talk a little bit about green hydrogen? We're on the theme of green here, Green New Deal, Green Climate Fund, and now green hydrogen. Yeah, green hydrogen is my favorite subject, has become my favorite <laughs> subject in the last few years. <laughs> Obsessed by it. No, but before I get into green hydrogen, I want to add a little bit about the loss and damage. And maybe some of the people here in the room who have more expertise in that will tell us more. Um, I have huge doubts about it. First of all, when Sabrina pointed out the climate finance that has not materialized, and even if it materialized, it materialized in the form of debts, but that loss and damage seems to be a toothless mechanism, not legally binding, and now it is hosted by the word bank. Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear from you what, what, what you think about that. In terms of examples of green colonialism, neo-colonialism, and green grabbing, um, the Arab region, especially the North African region, uh, is ripe with a lot of examples. And green hydrogen is just one um, example of those. There are big solar plants, wind farms, with an ex export-oriented uh, element going always to safeguard the EU energy security, and so the EU European countries would reach their climate targets. But green hydrogen, I think, concentrates a lot of the contradictions and the deceptions of that global energy transition that they are talking about. Um, first of all, it has an export-oriented element, clear, uh, at least in the North African region, but also in other countries in the African continent and the global South. Namibia, South Africa are big examples of really projects that are creating new green sacrifice zones. But let me maybe go more concretely a little bit with, with Morocco. I'll give you a few numbers. So Morocco, relatively is much more advanced in terms of renewable energies than their neighboring countries in the, in the region. But still, 80% of its electricity is generated from imported fossil fuels. So Morocco is not a fossil fuel country, so it imports fossil fuels to uh, generate its own electricity. Um, but what we're doing with green hydrogen is that we are building solar plants and wind farms to produce green electricity and then we are desalinating water from the seas and, and the oceans. 
you use that green electricity, you break the molecule of water, and you generate what is called clean green hydrogen. In countries like Morocco that face uh, huge droughts, water stress, semi-arid regions, using the desalinated water, um, shifting it from drinking water and local agricultural use is not really sustainable. And, and that electricity that you should use to break the, uh, the, the molecule of water to generate hydrogen, to export it. That's, that's the problem. You're, you're not even producing it for your own usage. To export it, why don't you use that electricity for your own needs? So that's why we are pushing you know, the argument about green. And I'm sure there are a lot of examples in Latin America. Maybe, maybe Sabrina, Chile, I'm sure. Yeah, so good, good thing that you brought up Chile. So Chile is expecting to sell the cheapest green hydrogen. Uh, it has a lot of potential for solar and wind expansion in areas that are considered to be emptier, so more desertic, which is something that we exploit when we're talking, like when we're talking about green colonialism, part of the narrative is saying there's no people there. Mm. So you can't have a sacrifice zone. There are no problems. So let's just like build these mega projects around renewables. And But what's very interesting in the push for green hydrogen uh, across the global south, but Chile, Colombia, Brazil, pl places I've been looking at more closely, is a lot of these hubs for technological transfer, for knowledge transfer, and for investment, where you have the role of the, you know, the EU, France, Germ Germany, the UK very involved in these processes is that they all talk about green hydrogen as uh, the fuel of the future because it's going to help with other areas, especially in transportation, where it's harder to just put electric batteries in it. So mm -hmm. for trucks, for example, uh, and they talk about like the role that, that this could play. But we do know that in current society, hydrogen dem demand is driven by big industry, not necessarily transportation. And when we're talking about big industry, one, one part of it is oil refineries. Mm -hmm. So uh, refineries need hydrogen for the hydro desulfurization dis process. Uh, and it's a way of taking sulfur out, out of fossil fuels in order to um, produce uh, other output. And we know that there's already a big push coming from the fossil fuel industry to make its fossil fuels less carbon intensive by using green hydrogen to green refine fossil fuels. See, this is what's happening. So it, this is really important for us to understand that like fossil capital and green capital, they're the same avenue. They're working together. They're in the same industry, in the same company. Sometimes that's why in Europe, they're building green hydrogen plants right next to oil refineries. And when we're talking about these commodity exports uh, from North Africa, from Latin America, not only there are transportation issues for because hydrogen is harder to take to very, very uh, long distances. One of the avenues that they're claiming right now is that, well, let's talk, let's produce Ammonia, and then maybe we can reconvert it back. And um, green ammonia is also something that big egg is looking into in terms of fertilizers. So all of these interests are combined into perpetuating the old systems, not transitioning into a new one. Excellent. Thank you. Lots of Give your example of what you think the uh, case of green colonialism that might have the most, in your opinion, negative impact, or the one that worries you the most. And I should say that this will be the pivot question, because we're going to pivot from talking about the, uh, the analysis of the terrible cases of green colonialism to some of the alternatives. But we're going to wrap up the terrible cases with you, Miriam. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It's very difficult to set priorities, I must say, um, because there are so many layers to it. Yeah. So maybe I'll just go as one example into mining uh, and into the conversation about uh, transforming individual mobility from fossil fuel driven to electric which is the dominant conversation around the world. 
and supposedly it solves something and it doesn't solve anything but create lots and lots of problems uh, because there are so many mineral needs attached to all those billions of cars that would have to be produced. Um, and yeah, in our countries, for example, Ecuador, where I live, is one of the hotspots in biodiversity in the world, but all these uh, biodiverse regions are now very thoroughly menaced by mining and where the big companies can't go in, they send illegal mining so that they can already destroy the zone and then the big stuff can still be made. Yeah, it's like, and it complicates resistance very much because you don't have a clear addressee. It's like criminal structures with lots of arms and uh, very loose uh, manners, I would say. So it makes the resistance dangerous and it complicates it also in legitimacy terms because uh, mining is now done to save the planet. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the conversation we are totally missing at the same time is how can we engage in structural changes, for example, in collective mobility, which would be good quality, which would be accessible or even free, which would be uh, secure so that people don't need individual cars and change our imaginary of what a successful life is and detach social status from having cars. And, but that is very hard to really get running. <laughs> and the thing that is attached to it and that also worries us very much is that as Sabrina and Hamza already pointed out, we are again in a national international division of labor that puts countries of the global south in a position where every country is told, oh, you have the best comparative advantage because here, and it's there in the texts from German uh, cooperation agencies, for example, you have so much uh, solar potential here and you have these huge deserted areas. And so it's great. You will be our primary partner. But then you look and they have exactly the same text for Chile for Colombia, for Brazil, for Uruguay, for South Africa. And one says, okay, so they're going to go for the cheapest in the end, right? And this is exactly what happens with the minerals on the other side too, and with which has happened in the last decades in Latin America with mineral with mining in general, like the copper competition in sending copper to China and which has been really harmful to the national economies also because it has hindered them from diversifying. Thank you, Miriam. And obviously we didn't design this event just to depress you. We didn't <laughs> write these books just to depress you. In the book and up here, we're also gonna talk about alternatives, alternatives to green colonialism. And I'd like to turn to you, Sabrina, what, concrete alternative to green colonialism gets you most excited, gets you most excited not only for, you know, its, uh, its reality on the ground, but also its potential to scale out, as we say, not scale up, make bigger, but scale out in the potential to adapt to other places and other contexts. All right. Well, um, earlier this week, we were in New York, I was promoting the book, and I gave some examples around transit, but I want to talk about food sovereignty with you today, because I think um, it shows a really good perspective on how you connect a lot of different things at the same time. So a good approach for scaling things out in the sense that it helps to uh, provide for needs that are on the ground, more local and demands for better livelihoods, jobs, and how you're approaching nature. But you also can, can take it to like the international uh, sense is if we con we're combining popular agrarian reform. So it's not just about distributing, but also like with, with, with power while you're doing the land, popular association, the role of social movements here is really important agroecology because there's no point in just distributing land and then there's go just going to be using agrochemicals and filling uh, back into the same way of like monocrop production and 
quote unquote here, green revolution processes, um, ecofeminism, because we know that the role of women in leading a lot of these movements cannot be ignored, the way they've been so key in protecting seed sovereignty, they've been so key in like uh, keeping people healthy on the land and also denouncing um, uh, a lot of the violations at like leading um, struggles against their territories becoming sacrifice zones and how this can have a good approach for food sovereignty in the sense that it connects um, demands for like more biodiversity using uh, different types of resources eating better healthier um, eating closer to home so making sure that when we're producing when we're using the land we're using it to abide by our needs and to actually have like cultural um uh co cultural uh ideals behind it as well you know uh we know that one of the aspects of colonialism is changing the way that people eat what's available to them it's like killing there's uh, aspects that we study as nutricide and nutricide comes also with epistemicides, also killing knowledge systems around food growth. And we think that it's very important to restore that, bring that into the conversation. And that way we can stand up to big egg, the role of fertilizers and um, industrial animal exploitation contributing to climate change. And we can decommodify our food system. So we're not thinking of like ultra processed goods or the fact that countries like mine, Brazil, are using uh, most of the soil and promoting deforestation and poisoning the environment. I mean, they are just investigating a big guy uh, uh, behind uh, like um, big egg in Brazil who was using um, um, Agent Orange, right? To, to deforestate part of the, the Pantanal biome just now, just now. And like the area is the size of like an entire state of the country. And he owes the state, like the Brazilian state uh, now more than 5 billion reais in fines just there, just doing his own thing, right? Because there's this level of impunity because of class power behind it. So I do believe that this type of approach can help us tackle and like fight many different fronts at the same time in an interconnected way. Thank you, excellent. And I have to say, having had a couple of meals up in New York and down mm -hmm. here, Sabrina, uh, it eats the way she talks. <laughs> and uh, so we, we had some excellent vegan uh, meals to look at and a vegan piece of vegan cheesecake that I, I didn't even know you could get vegan cheesecake. So, but you mentioned fighting back. And, and so for the last question up here, before we go to you in the audience and you online, is a question for you, Hamza. Um, you've talked very inspirationally, I have to say, about uh, resistance uh, and the importance of resistance um, because we can talk about alternatives but you know we have to get from here to there and to get from here to there often requires resistance activism against and I'm, I'm curious if you can give us maybe an example or two of the resistance you've seen against uh, both fossil fuels and green colonialism that you think can be transformational, that can lead to, you know, uh, not just resistance against a specific project, but toward transformation of system? Obviously, that's a big question. <laughs> it's not easy to answer. But before I get into this, and I think there are things that I'd like to, to comment on around the questions of green hydrogen and the push for these technical and technological solutions. The, what underlies this is capitalism trying to reproduce itself under the weight of the contradictions and its failures through techno fixes, through that blind techno optimism. And basically this maintains the status quo of imperialist domination, accumulation by dispossession, creating sacrifice zones while pushing for these solutions of green hydrogen, carbon capture and sequestration, carbon trading, all these false and bullshit solutions. Um, but 
just to comment on what Miriam said, it's about cheapening and trying to get cheap resources down there and cheap labor and use cheap labor. I don't think it's just about that, at least in the green hydrogen uh, arena. It's about creating a new green hydrogen economy and dominating the value chains at the technology level, creating new dependencies. So it's not the countries in Morocco or Namibia or South Africa who are going to own the technologies and produce and industrialize. It's about the first movers who happen to be Germany and the European Union and countries in the north. So I just wanted to say that. In terms of resistance, I think in here we need to center Palestine. Palestine is important to, to center in these discussions. We cannot talk about colonialism and decolonizations and, you know, and forget about Palestine because fossil capital, fossil colonialism and green colonialism are dynamics happening right now in Palestine. And people in Palestine are resistant, you know, through what they call steadfastness, sumud, either sumud or eco-sumud. People are resistant to survive against that colonial state. And I think there is a lot of lessons that we can learn from Palestinian resistance. Because what, whatever they pour on us, whatever the catastrophes they put on us, whatever the, the darkness that we feel, people are not passive victims. They resist. And I think this is important to centralize here. So we need to keep organizing, building international solidarities between North and South, South and South, between working movements, trade unions, peasantries, um, precariats, connecting those dots and struggles together. From the region, for me, I'll, I'll finish by that, um, John. In Tunisia, for example, um, whatever we think about the political and socioeconomic situation, it's not as rosy as it was after the uh, revolution there in 2010, 2011. Um, foreign ca international capital is trying to strangle Tunisia through debt and pushing it towards a kind of a neoliberal transition. That's what's happening in there. But there are some struggles here and there. And it's a partner that I work with, trade unionists, trying to push the conversation on energy democracy and just transition within the trade union movement, but at the same time, connecting it to land struggles. And I find that unique because all over the world, the trade union movement is resisting those discussions around land, indigenous communities, what happened? They think just about you know, centralized energy um, and workers, at, at that, which is important, but what about the communities? What about the indigenous communities where those projects are happening? And I find that this conversation needs to be strengthened, expanded in the region and, and beyond, so we can connect, con connect different sections of the working people for that dr just transition that we, we aim at. Jeremy, you want to talk about Yasumi? Yeah, I would like just to add an example from Latin America, which I think fits very well in this transformative resistance uh, framework, which is the struggle that has been going on now for 25 years uh, about leaving the oil in the ground in the heart of the Ecuadorian Amazon, which is the Yasumi National Park. And it was a proposal that came from civil society that then was taken up by the progressive government of Rafael Correa for some years as a government policy, trying to get contributions from the global north to compensate the non-exploitation of oil in the uh, state finances. Then it was dropped again by the government and they said, okay, we don't get enough, so we still have to go to exploit. And it was taken up again by civil society, especially by a youth movement called the Yasunidos, who since then have struggled for a referendum for everybody in the country to decide. And that has taken place finally after a series of frauds and lawsuits and last uh, August. And in spite of a very aggressive campaign that was basically saying, if we don't have the oil revenues from the Yasuni, we will have uh, no education, no health system, kids will die from hunger <laughs> and the country will go totally bankrupt. 
60% of voters have voted to leave the oil in the ground. And now there is this uh, legal imposition that the oil wells already in place have to be built back. And the, con the region has to be restored both in social and in ecological ways. And this is also a huge challenge, of course, how to do that, right? But I think it shows that real things can be done beyond the discourse that we somehow have to decarbonize our economies and make that in numbers on paper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we've, we've given you a taste, just a taste. <clears throat> if you want the full meal, it's in the book, obviously, uh, in both books. And they will be for sale for a price that will be determined by you and us <laughs> individually, <laughs> according to what you have um, after this session. Um, I'd like now to open up the conversation to include you, to get some questions from you. I want to ask Netva if, um, if I take my computer and open it up and log on, will I be able to see the questions coming on from, I can, oh, no, no, I won't? No, I okay. Well, I'll, I'll just come over and look on your computer then while people are, well, we could do that. Are there a number of questions there already? Oh, okay. Oh, same person. Who have questions in the audience with one, two. So let's take these two first. Oh, okay. And then I'll, I'll come is a reality in the global south so we know it's not the success it's actually the opposite when they are successful is when the empire strikes back right so just just wanted to, to dig more on that and precisely in that sense uh i wanted rather hamza to invite to speak about what you said yesterday about uh the broader imperialist project around israel uh, because I think uh, it seems like for many people, it's very comfortable to think that that is a regional conflict, but something that is very localized and it's actually pretty much the opposite, especially with the complicit, complicitness, criminality of Germany and the US and the UK, et cetera, in upholding the, the genocide for a larger uh, energetic process and of geopolitical domination in, in, the, in the region. So especially tackling what the, this uh, experience amazing um, portrayal that you gave yesterday on Israel and how it's also utilizing the region for larger purposes. Because I think to me, the issue of, um, of the imperial project at this moment is a, it's a great discussion to have, especially in the global north, because we need to demand people in the global north to mobilize against this imperial dynamics. So I just wanted to invite you all to, to, see, to share your views. Thank you. And, and for people online, we're, we'll repeat the question. So because you won't have heard it. So before you answer the question, just repeat very quickly what the question was. We'll take Basaf. Yes, and uh, this is again for all three of the panelists. What do you see? It's kind of a two part question. What do you see as the parallels between 
colonialist creation of sacrifice zones across the global south and what you can term internal colonialism and creation of sacrifice zones uh, within the global north, especially in you know countries like uh, the U.S., Canada, Australia, which are the central colonial. Uh, and second part to that would be what do you see as the potential for solidarity between uh, movements in the global south and movements of, to use the uh, terminology we use here in the US, frontline communities uh, in the global north uh, as a way of, of resistance, essentially. Let's take those two. And remember, repeat the question before you answer it, and then we'll go to the folks online. All right. Um, so Emilia asked about these impure dynamics uh, smashing alternatives, and like even if they're coming through the state or through the territory. So to give some examples on that. Um, I think uh, like, let's mention Honduras and Panama. I think those are good cases. Panama last year, there were like uprisings in the streets trying like to kick out uh, first quantum mining. So like a, a Canadian corporation involved in like an open pit copper mine in Panama, lots of people in the streets an alliance of social movements. So like there were like union leaders and students and families getting involved in this saying they didn't want a Panama to be an eternal sacrifice zone. Um, the courts find the project to be unconstitutional they roll it out, and our first quantum is suing Panama over this, right? In Honduras, you have Somara Castro as a progressive president. Um, she's been faced with a lot of like opposition from the far right, intervention from outside on this, like lots of like complicated narratives to try to delegitimize uh, her. And one of the things that Castro has done is to question the, the contracts behind a lot of these mining um, uh, initiatives with foreign corporations in Honduras and also the big um, Prospera project, which is a uh, like special economic zone in Honduras that is sort of like a private city with, um, with like its own uh, uh, code. And then, so like like different laws in the area. So ruling that out and now Prospera is suing the Honduras government based on a World Bank arbitration system uh, for like billions of dollars, right? So these mechanisms that go through multilateral agreements, free trade agreements, the World Bank are allowing corporations to sue what in theory are sovereign states when they say, not here, not in a backyard, not in our territory. So um, this is something for us to be quite aware in terms of um, how dangerous it is to have the World Bank in charge of the loss and damage fund, for example. And what Basa was um, like in terms of like internal colonialism in the global north too, very interesting example. So when um, we started talking about Bolivia, like the the like the coup with Janine Añez, and people were saying, oh, like that's happening in Bolivia over lithium. And Elon Musk went on Twitter when it was Twitter, when it wasn't his yet, and he said that, well, we will cool whoever we want. I think we remember that, right? And then there was backlash over it. And then he said, No, 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 no. The majority of our lithium comes from Australia. So there's nothing wrong with that. When in fact, Australian lithium is involved with dispossession of Aboriginal territories, right? So sometimes there's this normalization that if there's something really bad happening, if there's dispossession, exploitation, and people are getting crushed and human rights violations, especially around extractivism, these are only happening in the so-called global south. When we have lots of examples around this, right? And like in the US and Canada, we're talking of like about the pipelines going through First Nations territories and how, you know, uh, in Canada, the actual like the Trudeau government became like the biggest defender of the pipeline, saying, well, now it's a, a national interest. So things have changed. So th those things are absolutely interconnected. And that's why when we're calling, um, you know, about like the joining struggles internationally, 
we're talking about global north and global south in geopolitical terms, but we understand that the, the marginalized people we should be united because the struggles are the same. Uh, I think I have learned quite a lot about sacrifice zones in the global north when I went to Jackson, Mississippi to a gathering last year. I was really impressed by the different levels of exclusion that came together and played out together in this territory, mainly inhabited by African Americans, and how urban infrastructure it was like visiting a landscape in ruins literally and i was really impacted even me i come from germany i know there's lots of inequality i know there's poverty and social conflict in the global north but seeing this level of destruction and just abandonment stroked me hard <laughs> and um yeah so i think one of my endeavors being someone from the global north living and working in the global south is precisely this to bring people to see the contradictions and not to have this plain photograph of the north is rich the south is poor it's not <laughs> that way and to in these uh, cracks find precisely uh, maybe the the hold-ons for possible collective action and for a mutual understanding that uh, how how solidarity could work in the future right because you also asked about the potential of solidarity and i think uh, once we have understood that that um inequality is all over the place that um there are communities whose modes of living uh, we have to reconstitute and we have to strengthen because they somehow are at the margins of capitalist accumulation. Then we get hold of each other. And I have this vision of like equivalent constituencies like trade unions and trade unions and municipalities and municipalities or maybe universities and universities looking at this together in bilateral work a uh, strategic bilateral work north and south which would also bring us to not center so much on the loss and damage fund and all that's going on at the only macro global level because i think we have to see both i am very much in favor of multi-level multi-actor strategies and of course we cannot serve all of them each one of us we have to see each other like where is our strength but we shouldn't um, devalue the others who are working on other levels and yeah I, I think Sabrina has pretty much made the point I think that if we do not see the global economy as it is as a um, system of global governance which favors corporations over people systematically and which has set up a set of rules that pushes the peoples of the, the peripheries that can be peripheries in the north and in the south into mm -hmm. only serving those accumulation interests and the interests of some privileged islands in this world uh, then we will not be able to tackle green colonialism at all. So, uh, yeah, it's a very central aspect to, to have that in our minds and in our action. The question, is, um, the question on imperialism. <laughs> um, I think one of the cornerstones for global just transition or just transition um, in the global south or move towards the emancipatory fu futures that we are fighting for. For me, the vision is eco-socialism. Um, but, but I'm open to, <laughs> to other ideas and, and, and visions of the world. Um, one of the cornerstones is delinking and decolonization. Um, what do I mean by delinking? is for the countries of the global south or the peripheries who are inserted into a subordinate position in the international division of labor is to build economies 
in looking inward, oriented to, first of all, uh, putting the priorities of the local population first. Um, it doesn't mean autarky, like um, closed systems, but first of all, the priorities of communities and working people in those countries first. Um, that D-Linking project, uh, actually influenced by the dependency school and uh, from Samir Amin and, and, and other thinkers, is not gonna happen just in one country. So you need to create um, solidarities and linkages, I believe, south-south. Um, and some of these need to happen at the state level. I'm still a believer um, that we need to recapture the state, democratize it, decolonize it, um, because the state right now, I think, is a useful tool in that, especially in the, uh, the climate emergency. But I agree with you completely, Emilia. Resistance at the popular level or the trade unions or the communities is not enough on its own um, because the constraints are so huge through the neo-colonial and imperialist tools of domination, trade agreements, the debt bondage and servitude system, you mentioned sanctions, um, and then you have the dollar primacy, um, and then you have also institutions like the WTO, the World Bank, shaping how economic policies are implemented or enforced or forced on those on, on those countries. But we are living in a world that is moving, I think, into a multipolarity that has its potentials, uh, its opportunities, but at the same time, its dangers. I feel that it can create some rooms for social movements and progressive forces to maneuver. And I think these are tactical and strategic questions that those movements need, need, need to take up. But um, one example to, to show how those imperialist constraints and how imperialism works even in that transition is the case of Indonesia. Indonesia is very rich in nickel. Nickel is considered as one of the critical raw materials important for the energy transition and the electrical vehicle chains and electrical batteries. So people like us who live here in the imperial cores would continue having cars and driving electrical cars and all, and all that stuff. So Indonesia is an emerging economy. They said, we're not gonna export nickel in its raw form. We're gonna process it inside. We're gonna create more value inside move up the value chain, industrialize, and yeah, take opportunity of that global transition and, and maybe sell batteries. That, that comes with its own contradiction. It's not a perfect process because there, there will remain extraction, there might be pollution, there might be dispossession, but I would support that move myself, move up the value chain. What happened? The European Union took Indonesia into the World Trade Organization, WTO, and sued them there. The case is still ongoing, basically telling them, how dare you industrialize and build an economy that creates more value for your own people. So we are up against those challenges and we need to know these things so to, to not be deceived. So the fight is at multi-layers and multi-levels. I completely agree. We need to fight the neo-colonial <laughs> trade agreement, the debt systems, the IFIs, the international financial institutions. We need to find uh, uh, to be against the sanctions, to be against the uh, dollar primacy, and, um, and so forth. And in here, it connects with the question of um, Israel. Israel is a central part of that imperial colonial project that is called the West. Um, if you go back to the 18th century uh, and link the emergence of fossil capitalism and especially a steamship, um, it, the first time those steamships have been used were to bomb Bakka in Palestine, 1840. Uh, and why? Why did they bomb Akka at the time? Because they were fighting the Egyptian ruler at the time who wanted to expand and to industrialize. And at the time, um, the British Empire had a trade, a free trade agreement with the Ottoman Empire. So they wanted to sell their industrial product, which, is, which was cloth. Um, 
So what they did, they said, this Egyptian guy is going to be dangerous for us. So we need to bomb them. And they forced a trade agreement on them. And those interconnections between fossil capital, fossil empire, uh, trade imperialism, debts, um, uh, and genocide, and the destruction of Palestine today are really interconnected with the climate crisis and, and the destruction of, of, of Earth. And Israel, uh, if we go to the 7th of October, why the Palestinians are being punished and what happened in there is a disruption of the imperial colonial project. Basically, Hamas disrupted all of that beautiful party that Israel was normalizing the relations with countries in the region. There was an announcement there will be a big Saudi-Israeli normalization, which would mean the burying and the elimination of the Palestinian cause. So that 7th of October is a very significant moment because Israel is a central part of the imperial project. It wants to become an energy hub. It's, it's exploiting a lot of resources in the East Med. These are not the resources of Israel, but resources of Palestinians and Lebanese. Um, and, it, and it exports that gas to the European Union. At the time of the genocide, the first few weeks of the genocide, Israel issued licenses to many fossil fuel companies, including ExxonMobil and BP, to explore for gas in the East Med. And they are doing the same thing at the level of renewable energy. So it's intermeshed. So these are these questions are really important. And I think I, I talked a lot. <laughs> that was excellent. Excellent responses to those questions. Netva, can you can you give us the at least Manuel's questions from online? And, and I can make them hear you so you don't have to change it. One, two, three. Okay. So the there's Manuel has kind of two in one. Hoping this isn't off topic, but to Miriam, can you say what what do you think about the referendum of April 21st in Ecuador and the question about accepting again international arbitration on investments, ISDS, and how this relates to green colonialism? And to all, everyone, how does ISDS the, uh, and, uh, and green colonialism relate? Uh, yeah, actually, we have a referendum coming up, which is now promoted from the president, uh, by the president, and it's mainly about security issues because of the uh, officially declared internal war against organized crime since January. But uh, there is one question specifically related to reforming the 2008 constitution. This is the constitution that established for the first time the rights of nature constitutionally. And this, the article they want to reform uh, forbids uh, international arbitration. Mm -hmm. And so it's like opening up mm -hmm. the country again to all those examples we already have heard, which would severely limit the possibilities of uh, ongoing whatever governments there are to um, yeah, make democratic reforms, for example, because people push for them uh, and they would have to prioritize the interests of transnational capital. And there is one case which is right around the corner. If that would be accepted in the referendum, then Ecuador would have to pay $2 billion to Texaco, to this oil company that withdrew from the Northern Amazon without any kind of ecological reparation after its operations uh, because they lost the lawsuit here in the US, although they won all the last lawsuits in the Ecuadorian territory. So it's a very clear example of how these arrangements around dispute settlements are profoundly not democratic and privileging international interests, imperial interests. Well, I just like the Honduras and the Panama examples that I mm -hmm. gave earlier, exactly, exactly that, right? So, um, uh, the what happens is like, um, IS, ISDS is, um, is a way for like investors to make direct claims against the states based on breaches. And these breaches can be from different types of agreements. It can be like the 
these in, like internal contracts or something like more based with uh, the agreements that are made between two or more states. So we're, we're talking about these multilateral agreements here. So these are, um, <laughs> this, sorry, there was a little bit of noise. Uh, these are the um, investor state dis dispute settlements and then they're treated through a center within the World Bank. Um, so like we understand that the potential for these to be used is actually enlarging right now. It's being more and more used. Uh, the more that the corporations, like the, the level, like the lawsuits involve an amount of money that's just prohibitive to the, the size of some of these nations. We're talking about like huge chunks of the GDPs. So in a way, they're almost like, threats rather than we're actually going to win in court and going to owe us a lot of money. So we have bullying countries and making some of them into examples. See, look what they did here. They threw us off. They told us that we couldn't dig for oil here anymore. Uh, and now we're creating so much problems and uh, the, so many problems. And these problems uh, also reflect, for example, in investment and credit ratings later on. So they can have ripple effects into the economy of a country, not just the lawsuit, lawsuit itself and that particular piece of debt itself. So it's a way of like saying, okay, so all of the other countries don't go getting any funny ideas, right? Yeah, on the ISDS is just an, another form of um, imperialist plunder and domination. Um, ISDS is usually a clause that takes place in free trade agreements that allows um, for multinationals and the corporate sector to sue governments, to take them governments in international arbitration courts um, because some regulation introduced by the government, either environmental or social, is touching the bottom lines and the profits of those factories. And they have been used many, many times against governments, not just in the South, but also in the North, by many companies, including the fossil fuel industries. And I have a lot of examples in, in the region. But what, but I wanted to, to highlight, we need to put ISDS in the bigger picture, the broader picture of the economic transformation that we are seeing right now. Because um, that free trade agenda that the global north has been pushing in the south um, with barrels and guns and, and tanks um, now is, is being reversed in a way here in the global north. So we are seeing more protectionism in the US and the European Union um, in order to compete with the rising powers like China to dominate and monopolize the green value chains in terms of extracting and processing raw materials, in, in terms of manufacturing solar panels and wind turbines and electrical batteries, in terms of manufacturing electrolyzers for the green hydrogen. So we are seeing those geopolitical competitions. And the Inflation Reduction Act is one of those protectionist mechanisms here in the US to what they say, to reshore or onshore industrial, um, you know, green industrial value chains here, here in the US while doing some friend shoring, trade agreements, deals with friendly regimes and, um, and governments in the South, so to control the mineral resources. So the US is trying, for example, to do deals with the, the DRC to control some of the cobalt, and that cobalt actually most of it is controlled by China right now. So you see what we are seeing here, and the same thing happens in the European Union. There is a critical raw mineral act, and why? They want to see how they're going to capture and monopolize and dominate those resources wherever they can find them so they can maintain their relevance, not just relevance, their imperial status in, um, in that world. Okay, well, we got, well, let's take a mix. Uh, we'll take two, three. We have three here. Let's do three here, and we'll go back online, starting in the back and then coming down front. Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Melanie Foley. I'm a public citizen, and um, this conversation has just kind of miraculously gone to two of the things I want to talk about. Um, this means we're talking about resistance and solidarity, and people here probably know, maybe even help organize the march and rally that's happening tomorrow, noon at Edward R. Murrow Park. 
Um, and so, you know, under the tagline, urbanized, decolonized, uh, and um, uh, my organization is working with IPS and some others to have a, a contingent there focused on trade justice. And so we're going to be, you know, flagging that the, the World Bank is the home of the majority of these ISDS spaces. And uh, now we're going to have signage, um, you know, supporting Honduras and their struggle against Prospera. Um, I actually was just uh, in Honduras about a month ago. So, you know, working with the community there and, um, and also with the campaigners in Ecuador, you know, supporting them against this referendum coming up. And so having, you know, photos with people outside the World Bank really like, talking about their issues, you know, and supporting the campaigners in those countries is, you know, a great, you know, north-south solidarity moment that we can all have. Um, and then on the on minerals, um, you know, the Inflation Reduction Act, there's a comment period open right now um, on supply chains. And so we're working with a lot of organizations to submit comments saying that in, you know, in the Inflation Reduction Act, um, they're signing now critical minerals agreements, the U.S. is with trying to negotiate one with Indonesia, among mm -hmm. others, that, you know, if they're going to do something like that, it has to have requiring informed consent, it has to, you know, meet all of these high standards, which they're currently not meeting. Um, so, sorry, more of a comment, but we'd love to work with folks here on that. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And just for folks online, uh, if you're in the D.C. area, there's going to be a march tomorrow. And the, what park does it begin? Noon at Edward R. Murrow. Uh, noon at Edward R. Murrow. There'll be a trade contingent that's sponsored by Public Citizen and uh, highlighting ISDS cases. Um, and uh, that um, also with critical minerals, with the IRA Inflation Reduction Act, there's a comment period coming up. Uh, and uh, Public Citizen is le leading an effort to uh, to include changes in the IRA uh, covering uh, trade agreements with, especially on uh, critical raw materials with countries like Indonesia, to include some of the basic standards that we've been pushing for on environmental uh, labor regulations. So thank you very much. Second question. Uh, hi, um, thank you all for this panel. Uh, my name is Akam Shikana. I am a research associate at Georgetown University. Um, and my work focuses on anti-colonial approaches to sustainability. Um, so I have, I guess, two, two separate questions. One of them um, focusing on, you know, the multi-level, multi-actor sort of strategy that you all spoke about. I wanted to hear your thoughts on what you think the role of universities and the role of middle classes in the global south is in supporting worker and indigenous movement communities as we struggle for ecological sovereignty. And then the second question is, um, as you brought up the R Congo, you know, one of the things that has been very present in my mind is we are able to witness the genocide in Palestine because of the constant exploitation of people in Congo and the technology that we have because of that. Um, wondering if you can speak a little bit more to how you're seeing globally patterns of colonialism reproduce over and over. Um, in order to, you know, keep this status quo going, um, and how we need to be centering countries south of the Sahara in these discussions um, about green colonialism. Excellent. Thanks. And third. Hi, my name is Carolina Garzón. I also from Ecuador. I uh, the director of Latin America Sustainability. I'm being here this week for the spring meeting of the World Bank. I thought that. I should share a little bit of what we hear. I'm so happy that you are talking about the World Bank and the need to have a multi actor and multi level strategies and to have this comprehensive overview of the problems. It's, it is very scary to participate on those meetings because what we are seeing is actually that the multilateral banks are seeing climate change as an opportunity, a business opportunity. Uh, most of the thoughts, I would say 99% of the thoughts is, well, what an opportunity we have in business, in bonds, uh, climate, financing, regenerating the economy, but zero, zero diagnosis of the problems, of what are the results, the outcomes that they want to see from those actions. And the whole conversation is in this middle part of the action which is not definition, but is sustainable financing, what is a green project, what, what do they need for creating the economy. 
and they are giving a huge, huge um, role to private investment. They are trying to use public funds to their risk projects and to give security to all these private investors that are going to put a lot of billions and billions of dollars to save the planet and by the way to make future profits. So that is what is happening and they are coordinating themselves. It's also the uh, Asian Infrastructure Bank uh, pushing for fossil fuel projects everywhere and trying to work this connectivity around the world, same with China to develop the initiative of these digital materials. And unfortunately, what I see my feeling, and please correct me, I'm so happy to see for you there's going to be a demonstration tomorrow that we are not putting enough attention to what they are doing. Policy and business plans, they are huge. They are coming hard. Uh, I don't see enough organization to have this multi multi-level strategy doing more policy work be behind them all the time, making them feel that we are not going to let them to do what they want to do. Excellent, thank you. I'm gonna ask the panelists if they can to, to focus on one of the three questions um, so that you don't answer all three of the questions, all three of you, because that would be nine comments. So what one uh, or six rather, I multiplied rather wrong. Um, so if you could choose one of the three and remember to repeat the question, we'll be good. I mean, they're all great questions, but you have to, if you can, restrain yourself and assume yeah. that your partner on the panel will do a great job. I just wanted to make a point that it was not three, it was like about six <laughs> topics. So if we choose three, this is also already pretty reductive. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm just going to pick some. I, we will be there tomorrow at the March. That's the first thing to say. And I think it's very important what you do, what you point out, all those efforts. And we have had also in Europe these legislation debates about su supply chain justice. I only wanted to shake it up a little bit because what, from our perspective, what really would be the horizon toward which we should move is not even to have more just supply chains. It's to get rid of supply ch global supply chains to the most possible extent. Like every region should envision its economy being responsible for the whole metabolic cycle from where do they get the raw materials from until disposal of those artifacts they produce. And that would be a perspective toward global justice. So reduce it to a minimum. And I know this is very difficult to talk about right now, but I think have it as a utopia is very important. And this is about the delinking scenarios Hamza was also addressing. Like uh, we have to get rid of the imaginary that other people in other parts of the world have to serve our well-being where we live just because it's always been like that because this is colonial right from the beginning um the role of universities and middle classes in the global south i can talk from my own experience and and experiments maybe <laughs> i think universities well they have been shaped toward neoliberalism very much, toward productivism, toward scientific output without getting into its usefulness and its quality and its uh, possibilities of appropriation by social forces. And this has to be wound back. <laughs> um, and I'm, I think that we won't get out of the current situation, especially regarding the environmental crisis, if we don't open up spaces for a real dialogue of knowledges, which makes space for other kinds of knowledge, which are experience-based, which are ancestral, which are indigenous people's knowledges, and um, which obviously are not sanctioned as scientific in the current institutional system. And that's what I see as a challenge for universities. Also in uh, selecting, making space for people 
to study and to transform the careers and the curricula that we offer. So it's a very thorough and integral reform that I would pre propose from the institutional design, design to the spaces where learning takes place and to the shape of those spaces, because it's not just about inviting an indigenous leader to talk five minutes in some space. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I leave it there and give to my colleagues. <laughs> Okay, like you, may, you mentioned like sub-Saharan Africa and things like that. And in the beginning, Miriam talked about like these illegal mining networks and organized crime and um, how in the end they're uh, either get into conflict with official legal mining or they open up the way for official legal mining, right? So we found that, for example, um, around gold, uh, we've had like a rise in the role of organized crime and when we mean organized crime is like uh, connected to drug trafficking or like uh, um, human trafficking, all kinds of smuggling and the supply chains, they get very much mixed. So like there's a lot of issues, for example, around illegal gold mining in Mali, in Burkina Faso, where I think Burkina Faso is about like um, 800 illegal mines, but also have the artisanal mining and like their terrorist cells going through that and like more proper organized crime um, going through that. And then they start selling uh, security services. So if you're having like terrorist attacks on a mine, then you have another militia cell that comes in and offers security services <laughs> to the mine against the terrorist cells. So the level of like criminal networking and new economies that come up from that, it's quite creative. And yeah, and so like, and in Latin America, we see this through um, Peru, Bolivia, Brazil on how like women like, uh, um, I talked about this earlier this week, the PCC, which is like Brazil's largest criminal faction that's like was very strong from the state of Sao Paulo, is now all over the Amazon um, promoting illegal mining together with like the, the smuggling around mercury, but that also involves cocaine. And then you have new uh, plane landing strips in protected areas in the Amazon, in Yanomami territory. And then it's at the same time where we're having you know, like the proper genocide of Yanomami peoples disappearing. Um, and the Brazilian government, even though now we're under a progressive government, is really struggling to like handle the situation because sometimes the, the national agency uh, uh, responsible for uh, indigenous assistance and support is requesting things from the Brazilian armed forces to provide security for them to be able to go into territory and provide the support. And then the Brazilian armed forces are not really responding because there are schisms between the government and the armed forces that were actually supporting the previous far right government. So like these networks are very complex to understand, but I think we absolutely need to find ways uh, to, to connect them because in the end, when we're talking about the supply chain, there's a, you mentioned Congo, right? Congo and cobalt, like that's a, a huge issue when we're talking about strategic minerals. And sometimes there's a tendency for even environmental NGOs to come out and say, no, we're going to find the better mines and we're going to provide them with certificates of sustainability and human rights. As if there was such a thing as like a super clean and like human friendly um, um, supply chain when Things uh, are, are related like to the previous colonial struggles in the region and, you know, the displacement of 7 million people that has been normalized for a really long time because you just go around and you say, oh, there's civil unrest, there's some social conflicts in the area, but obviously there's a lot of economic interests that are being uh, reinforced through these processes. All right. Um, the role of um, the university. To paraphrase um, one great guy called Marx, the point of analy anal analyzing and knowledge and scholarship is to transform the world, to change it. So if the analysis, I think most of the analysis produced by universities is about entrenching powers, power relations and domination. 
So I think if we're really serious about changing that world, scholarship and analysis need to be at the service of liberation um, and changing that world to a better place. So I think it's it's very important. So we need the pedagogy of the oppressed. We need to teach to tr transgress as bell hooks uh, exhort us to do. And I think this is this is the spirit that needs to be at the center of producing knowledge and university. We need to analyze capital in order to challenge it and stop it and resist against it. That's that's very important. The role of the middle classes. I I would just say uh, um, quickly. I think they need to commit uh, class suicide. They need to join the working classes, the peasantry, the marginalized and dispossessed communities and create those um, alliances necessary to shift the balance of forces against capital on the ground. The question around um, what happens in different countries in the global south in terms of um, DRC, a genocide is happening there and most of it actually is fueled by the rush to control uh, cobalt and other minerals. I think what happens and what happens in Palestine, there are a lot of lessons to be learned because our enemies, our oppressors learn from the mistakes and the strategies and the tactics they develop and they go and do better and oppress better and kill better in, in, in other parts of the world. And in here, I don't know if you heard, uh, just lately, Israel has revealed new weaponry in the genocide in Palestine. Is using artificial intelligence in killing Palestinians. And these are things that we need to be wary, connecting militarism, war with the climate crisis. Because, you know, the role of militaries is under-scrutinized and under-analyzed. The, the U.S. military, just on its own, is the biggest institutional CO2 emitter in the world. It emits more than Portugal, for example, more than Denmark, for example. Um, and, and there is a tendency that, you know, the biggest polluters are the biggest armament producers or, 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 or you know, pur purchasers. Now, I think we need to put that, that conversation in um, at the center. There is a lot of things to say about DRC and Namibia in terms of this, but just I'll finish on the point of um, the privatizations that is being pushed and seeing you know, that energy transition and the climate crisis as, a, as an opportunity, of course, that's how capital works. Uh, it benefits from crisis, um, it benefits from you know, um, times of uh, shock, as Naomi Klein was saying, the, the shock doctrine. And we are seeing is decarbonization by dispossession. We are seeing ecological imperialism, green colonialism. And you know they are putting forward some mechanism like public-private partnerships, it sounds good, but in reality, it's, you know, um, uh, privatization of the profit and socialization of, um, of the losses. And uh, yeah, so we need to move beyond this and fight for public services, fight the, the privatizations of energy, health, transport, and so forth, and connect with important debates that are happening around the energy transition in the North. And in here, I'm very sympathetic with the degrowth movement, at least the radical and anti-imperialists of the degrowth movement, because they are centering questions of imperial plunder and the creation of sacrifice zones down there. So I think there are things that, that can be done around that. Thank you, Hamza. We're, we're coming to the end, and I have to here uh, apologize to folks online, because we're not going to be able to get to all your questions, and I apologize for that. I want to give Miriam one last chance to, to respond to your intervention. Uh, and I want to give people, of course, a chance to go back there, scrutinize the book, look at the book, even buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Yes, Paulina, I very much agree with your perspective that actually the hegemonic reaction in the international institutions and also all kinds of strands of venture capital and startups is seeing the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis as a huge business opportunity and they're celebrating yeah and uh, what worries me is that that in politics we can see how the boundary of what is feasible of or what is even thinkable is not determined by its effectiveness in ecological terms but solely by its profitability. If it's not profit profitable, it cannot be done. 
So there is a huge cultural shift, which is like driving neoliberal reason to an, a suicidal end in some way, yeah? Because we're really undermining the material conditions of the reproduction of life as we know it on this planet by this reason. What can we do about it? I think we have to, in education, in our debates, in our actions, uh, restore other kinds of systems of valuation, which are not about profitability and money, like for what do we want to do things and center the organization of our actions and of the networks we build around care, for example, or around life itself. And there, I also would like to make a final uh, yeah, uh, recognition to the perspective of degrowth, because if we do not envision the reduction of our social metabolism worldwide in very absolute terms, without any kind of offset, without any kind of net in the equation, then we will not succeed. And that's like the very important point that degrowth has thrown into the debate and that we all have to take up regardless if we are in the global north or south. First of all, I want to thank the panelists for their astute observations and of course for their contributions, not only here, but in book form. With, and I apologize for pushing this book relentlessly, but I feel that that's my job here, the books that are available in the back. But I also want to thank you uh, online, uh, as well as here in, uh, in real time, for participating in this conversation about this absolutely critical topic. Um, I'd like to thank the Institute for Policy Studies, uh, which has sponsored this. Uh, and I would like, again, to thank you for coming today. And I would encourage you to. That is an excellent suggestion, Netva. For those who are online, we don't want to leave you out in terms of uh, accessing the information in this book. We will send you a link uh, to how you can get this book um, after this meeting is over. So let's give a round of applause to our panel. And the books are by donation only. Mm -hmm. <laughs>